When Marx was a young lad attending the University of Berlin, he was part of a philosopher's club known as the Young Hegelians. It is here that Marx and his peers studied Hegel's dialectic. Its triadic components include the thesis, which is the ideological status quo, the antithesis, which stands in opposition, questioning the status quo and pointing out its contradictions, and finally, the synthesis, when said contradictions are resolved, leaving only common elements behind. This is Hegel's conception of how conflicts in the world emerge, and how they resolve itself, and at face value it is a sound philosophical pillar, but it's missing something as Hegel assumes that people just come up with these ideas on their own, and that it is ultimately ideas that dictate human influence on the world. It was this flaw in Hegel's thinking that led Marx to criticize Hegel's dialectic, and eventually expanding upon it with the incorporation of the materialist world outlook. Ludwig Feuerbach's work, The Essence of Christianity, heavily influenced Marx's thinking at the time, as it was very critical of religion, exposing it for its idealist notions, baseless assertions, and claims of knowing things that no one can know. Feuerbach was a mechanical materialist, meaning that he believed the world we live in was purely material, and anything that we think we know had to be proven through material means, to be true. In 1843, Marx and his wife Jenny moved to Paris so that his work could be published without having to go through Prussian censors. For a year, while in Paris, he studied the writings and works of French socialist philosophers and would eventually come in contact with his lifelong best friend. In 1844, Marx met Frederick Engels, another young philosopher, who, like Marx, reached similar conclusions through studies of his own. Together, they completed the materialist world outlook and synthesized materialist dialectics and historical materialism. Materialist dialectics and historical materialism are two central pillars of Marxist philosophy. They are an acknowledgement that historical events unfold as a result of contradictions within and outside societies, that contradictions in the natural world, as well as their resolutions, are what lead to change, that it is not the mind of an individual that shapes the world around one, but the world around one that shapes the mind of the individual, and that history is ultimately driven forward by class struggle. For example, the contradictions in slave society paved the way for feudal society, the contradictions within feudal society paved the way for bourgeois society, the contradictions in present bourgeois society are at present paving the way for socialist society, and in socialist society, the contradictions within that economic mode will eventually pave the way for communism. The central point of this thesis is that as time goes on, as society becomes more advanced, and as we evolve in modes of production, the fewer and fewer social classes that are present within the economy, all the way to the point to where we are now, where there are two main classes, and there is only one major contradiction left, that is, between wage labor and capital workers and owners. But if we look back to the feudal era of old, that ranged from 400 AD all the way up until the early 1900s, when the last feudal societies had been wiped away or overthrown, many diametrically opposed classes had existed, be it peasants versus nobility, aristocracy versus the monarchy, landlords versus early capitalists, merchants versus other merchants, guildmaster versus journeyman, rentier versus rentier, etc, etc, etc. In each of these cases, the contradiction is the same. Exploiter versus exploited, pleb versus patrician, colonizer versus colonized, oppressor versus oppressed. Inevitably, however, through the eventual victory and overthrow of one class by another, civilization advances, and we have fewer and fewer social classes over time. In each economic mode, there is a revolutionary class typically one of the oppressed classes. In capitalism, the bourgeoisie, which is French for middle class, were that revolutionary class, because prior to the Industrial Revolution, they were the mid-income owners of small shops and businesses. So the revolutionary overthrow of the monarchy by the bourgeoisie is what made capitalism a socially progressive force. Feudal monarchies around the world were abolished, and liberal enlightenment took off scientific advancements blossomed and accelerated, and the productive forces of society were exponentially advanced. 
Of course, the overthrow of one class by another and the path of progress is not a linear one. It is better to think of it as a battle between the oppressed class and the new system that they will usher in to their benefit versus the ruling class in the old system that they seek to perpetuate to their benefit. So when people say, quote unquote, that socialism failed, look at what happened to the Soviet Union, they aren't taking into account the fact that it took centuries for capitalism to finally emerge from feudalism and monarchical dictatorship, or the fact that it took thousands of years before slave society was finally abolished. History is not linear. Sometimes we take a step forward, other times we take two steps back. Some centuries manifest as eras of glorious progress, while others manifest as eras of blackest reaction. As capitalism has progressed, as the countryside and the peasantry were proletarianized, as the last remnants of feudal and slave society were scrubbed out, as free market competition has championed the winners and discarded the losers, we are continuously progressing to a point to where there are only two classes left, the working class and capitalist class. There is of course the small business owner, but once again, as capitalism ages and as firms grow ever more powerful and centralized, as profitable opportunities continue to dry up, it becomes increasingly impossible for the petty proprietor to compete, and the small business owner increasingly finds himself descending back into the ranks of the proletariat. We are steadfast reaching a point as a civilization today, as the contradictions within this system mount on top of one another. Capitalism, in its gluttonous pursuit of more profits, is growing ever more unstable and destructive, seeking further and further avenues to increase exploitation through increasingly inhumane and barbarous means will eventually push the working class into a corner, and it is here that the final confrontation between workers and owners will commence. There are two possible outcomes from this scenario. Either the working class, like the oppressed classes before it, will rise up and overthrow the capitalists, establishing a new higher economic mode, that is socialism, or this final class conflict that we are heading towards will result in the mutual destruction of both classes, causing humanity to descend to a level of depravity and barbarism that has not been seen for centuries. In the latter case, we may actually regress to a lower economic mode of production, which as I have stated prior has happened before historically. So in summary, the battle between different social groups is really a battle of human consciousness. On one hand, the unconscious forces of reaction that seek to maintain things as they are to their own benefit, or even worse, to return to an idealist past that never was. While on the other hand, the conscious forces of progress that will eventually drag the ladder kicking and screaming to a better world and usher in a future that is brighter than anything that we can imagine. It was in a state of communism that humanity evolved, and it is a state of communism that humanity must logically return to if it, it seeks to reconcile the conflicts within itself.